Hello everyone, my name is Angela Van Duyken and I'm a wildlife conservation data analyst and mitigation technologist with The Land Between. Uh, today we'll be discussing uh, various techniques and solutions that we here at The Land Between and in partnership with EcoCare International, the leading experts on road ecology solutions, are using to mitigate turtle mortality on roads. So first let's delve into the facts about wildlife on roads. In Ontario, there are approximately 14,000 highway collisions each year involving wildlife, 600 of which are fatal. These collisions have an estimated cost of more than $39.2 million in property damages alone. So this number does not include personal injury costs. What's worse is that this number continues to grow larger as time goes on. But what about wildlife collisions in cottage country, the land betweens region? You would think that we have less people here and therefore less cars to hit wildlife, but it's actually quite the opposite. In fact, wildlife collisions in this region can account for as high as 50% of the total number of collisions along some highways. There has been increased road use by permanent and seasonal residents in the land between, especially since the COVID-19 pandemic started. In addition, population growth is increasing road use and putting pressure on towns and cities to expand their roads. More specifically, there is an increasing pressure for expansion northwards as population is expected to grow by over 50% over the next 20 years in the Greater Golden Horseshoe area. So when you think about wildlife collisions, you probably think about the typical deer and moose. This is because these larger animals typically cause the most car damage, injuries, or fatalities, and as a result, they tend to be the only wildlife collisions reported. However, even more unreported collisions occur with smaller animals, such as small mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles. For example, there was a study conducted on a 31 kilometer long stretch of road on the Thousand Islands Parkway that recorded 24,000 vertebrate collisions in just five months. That is a lot more than the official 14,000 wildlife collisions reported for all of Ontario as a whole. So if you're interested in learning more about wildlife collisions on roads involving more than just deer and moose, a great resource is the Wildlife on Roads, a handbook written by Carrie Gunson and Frederick Schruler at EcoCare. Uh, this book features a literature review outlining the impacts of roads on amphibians, turtles, squamates, mammals, and birds uh, with tips for collecting on-road information. It also includes species essays of diagnostic features relevant to road killed animals, as well as information as to why specific species may be found alive or dead on roads, and as well information on citizen science data collection and management with details on collecting location and photo information for uploading onto online databases such as iNaturalist. So this handbook can be purchased from ecocare.com uh, for $30. So if you know the land between, you know that this region is turtle country. It has the only rock barrens in the province and the highest percentage of shorelines to area in Ontario. It's also mainly intact. As a result, the land between region together with the Frontenac Arch are home to over one third of Ontario's turtles and are the last strongholds for most turtle species. However, increasing road use and the construction of new roads as the human population expands means that turtles are getting hit more on roads. Collisions with turtles can cause indirect damage, personal injury, and even fatality. There have been numerous reports of people swerving to avoid turtles crossing the road, and this can lead to collisions with oncoming traffic or cars veering off the road entirely. Both of these situations can cause indirect damage to vehicles, personal injury, or even fatality. There have also been many injuries, damages, and fatalities reported from people pulling over unsafely or walking on the road to help a turtle. A notable case of this occurred on Highway 507 in 2016, where a woman was unfortunately struck by a car after unsafely pulling over to help a turtle on the road. So we know that collisions with turtles on roads can be dangerous to us humans. But what about the turtles themselves? Why should we care what happens to their populations? There are actually many important reasons why we should care about the health of turtle populations in Ontario. The main reason is that turtles are a keystone species, which means they help define an entire ecosystem. 
They provide essential and irreplaceable ecosystem services to support our lakes, wetlands, and entire food webs. For example, turtles spread seeds and cycle nutrients to support fish nursery areas. They also nourish wetlands, they stabilize hazard lands, and colonize buffer areas. Without these functions, the landscape could not sustain fish and wildlife populations. Turtles also eliminate sources of harmful bacteria from lakes and waters by cleaning up, or essentially eating, the dead and decaying matter, and that ensures these waters are potable and safe for swimming. So without turtles, lakes and ponds can quickly become a health hazard. Given all the benefits that turtles provide us with, it only makes sense that we do our best to help them as well. So the first step in being able to help save turtles is to understand the threats affecting their populations in Ontario. Did you know that globally there are significantly more amphibian and reptile species at risk than either mammals or birds? This is because many reptiles, such as turtles, face a plethora of different threats. On this slide, you can see the main threats that turtles in Ontario face. One of the largest threats to Ontario turtles is road mortality. Turtles are slow moving species that must cross roads to reach other wetlands and fulfill their life processes. It also doesn't help that gravel road shoulders often provide ideal nesting habitat for turtles who do not know the dangers of cars and roads. Roads are a hazard to turtle survival and movement throughout spring, summer and fall, especially during nesting season, which occurs in late May to early July, and during hatchling season, which occurs in August to October. Because they are so small and can be in groups of up to 60 at a time, baby turtles are often unknowingly struck by cars as they emerge from, the, from their nests on the sides of roads. Another major threat is habitat loss and destruction. Critical habitats such as wetlands are needed for turtle survival and reproduction, and they are declining due to development. Residential and commercial development often select wetland areas to develop on, and as a result, this habitat is destroyed. More roads are also being constructed to accommodate the growing population. Roads can break turtle habitats into fragments by bisecting wetlands and other habitats, which also serves to increase the number of turtle encounters with vehicles on roads. Another threat is human subsidized predators, such as raccoons, skunks, and foxes. These animals are natural predators of turtles, but they're being subsidized or helped by human activities, such as leaving garbage out or deliberate feeding. As such, they have an increased prevalence near human settlements, which results in more predation on turtle nests. This threat worsens as population growth increases and human presence attracts more predators. For example, as more roads are built to reach new housing developments, and as more turtles lay eggs on these road shoulders, predators which eat these eggs will increase in population size, further contributing to the problem. Climate change is another threat to turtle populations. Like many other animals, turtles are experiencing negative effects due to climate change, specifically fluctuating water levels and temperatures which affect turtle nesting and hibernation periods, and also increase the prevalence of diseases. One of the biggest problems is that climate change is also changing habitat, causing wetlands to dry up and nesting areas to be flooded. Warmer temperatures attributed to rising global temperatures has also been shown to alter the ratio of male to female hatchlings since sex is temperature dependent. The last threat is a combination of invasive species, disease, and poaching. Red-eared sliders are an invasive species of turtle that often get released into our wetlands as unwanted pets. They can not only outcompete our native turtles for food and habitat, but they can also spread diseases to them. In addition, native turtles tend to be illegally collected for the pet trade, especially if they are very attractive looking species such as the spotted turtle and Blanding's turtle, and they are also sometimes sold as food. Although there are many threats to turtle populations in Ontario, this presentation will focus on the things that can be done to address one of the largest threats, road mortality. Scientific studies show that populations of turtle species are declining due to high rates of annual traffic mortality and that reptiles such as turtles, along with amphibians, were the most negatively affected species due to roads and traffic mortality in a meta-analysis of 75 studies. In Ontario, all eight of our turtle species are listed as species at risk. 
So what makes turtles so vulnerable as a species? Science indicates that turtles are more at risk than both mammals and birds from road mortality due to a variety of reasons associated with their life history traits. For one, turtles already have significantly diminished populations, which makes even just one turtle hit on the road a substantial loss and threat to the survival of the local population. Second, turtles often freeze in response to cars, much like a deer in the headlights, and are also very slow moving, which makes it difficult for them to avoid cars quickly. Third, turtles have low survival, survivorship of offspring since their nests are heavily predated, sometimes just minutes after they are laid, and hatchlings can be eaten by larger animals or stuck on the roads. Fourth, turtles must reach around 20 years of age before they can reproduce. This means that turtles must avoid the threat of road mortality for a total of 20 years to ensure that they have offspring and contribute to the population. Fifth, turtles have high nest site fidelity, usually for road shoulders. This means that they will return to the same nesting site along a road shoulder year after year to lay their eggs. Lastly, if a nest is lucky enough to survive, the hatchlings will still emerge in dangerous areas along the road in the open where they are vulnerable to predators and cars. So road mortality is such a huge threat to turtles because turtles already have small localized territories and are susceptible to local extinctions. This means population recovery is also extremely slow and uncertain. For example, losses of 20% of snapping turtles can mean extinction within 20 years and also the loss of the best cleaning crews for our lakes. In addition, 61% of turtles found on roads are females since they frequent road shoulders for nesting more often than males do, and that makes them more susceptible to road mortality. Did you know that female turtles lay eggs until they die at 100 years old or older, and the older they are, the more eggs they lay? Losing any long-lived females would seriously jeopardize the ability of a population to maintain itself. Given all these reasons, wildlife specialists indicate that reptiles should be a high priority for mitigation along roadways. So what has the land between been doing to address the threat of road mortality to turtles? There are two main techniques that we use to identify road mortality hotspots. Firstly, we conduct hotspot mapping to flag areas along a road that feature a wetland on either side, since these areas are the prime habitat for turtles who travel between wetlands to nest, migrate, and overwinter. Once we have these hotspots flagged, we verify them in the field, making sure to record any sightings of turtles or signs of turtles on the road, such as the presence of nests, turtle shells, and or fragments. Our staff and dedicated volunteers also travel designated routes throughout the land between in the spring and summer to assess and record any turtles on the roads, which helps to identify any new areas which were not previously identified by hotspot mapping. In the end, we end up with a list of crucial sites needing protection. So what do we do with this list of sites that need protection? Well, we start by sending out tunnel assessor volunteers or staff to evaluate each site and determine what solutions might be feasible. The first and most important objective for mitigating road effects and conserving wildlife is to keep such animals off the road while still allowing for their safe passage via underpasses. This is what we keep in mind when assessing each site. Fortunately, areas of crossing and collision are predictable, especially for turtles which frequent wetland areas. This means that it's often very easy to plan for when designing roads and applying solutions. Many different conservation groups have already implemented various styles of wildlife fencing and underpasses, such as the ones showed here by EcoCare. In addition, scientists are actively testing and studying new and innovative solutions. Installing fencing and culverts for turtle underpasses has been tested and proven as a highly effective solution. While these designs can vary depending on the funding available for the project, the species being targeted, and the site conditions or constraints, one of the tested, proven, and highly effective solutions is to install concave fencing and culverts for turtle underpasses. So what does this look like? 
One of the designs consists of concave fencing, which is a half pipe or half cut HDPE culvert that provides an incredibly stable and durable arch design. The concave shape also prevents turtles from climbing over the fence, and when areas are fully fenced in, it prevents turtles from reaching the road and attempting to cross, so long as the fence height is at least 60 centimeters or two feet tall. This type of fencing can be backfilled to be flush with the road grade or surrounding grade, which also allows movements of animals off the road should they end up there. As such, this fencing design allows for road permeability rather than creating a death trap for animals on the road. Furthermore, there are eco-friendly choices for building materials with this design. Food grade steel drums can be repurposed as wildlife fencing by simply cutting them in half and hand digging or using machinery to install them. It's important that the half pipe fencing be directed towards an underpass or culvert in order to facilitate the movement of turtles between wetlands. So turtles must be able to move between wetlands to mate, nest, and hibernate. And we don't want to restrict that um, if we can avoid it. As we mentioned before, there are many different designs, but in general, the underpass or culvert should be a minimum diameter of three feet or wider if the underpass length is longer than 41 feet, and that's to allow for sufficient openness. This is because turtles prefer to be able to see the end of the tunnel and have sufficient lighting within the tunnel in order for them to want to pass through it. The fencing should also encompass the entire wetland area plus an additional buffer if possible, and then elbow that into upland areas where turtles are hesitant to travel. The exact fence end is usually decided on a combination of the habitat, ecotone, and if, it, and if it can be tied into something like a rocky outcrop. Turtles naturally do not want to venture too far from water, and especially not into upland areas where they are more vulnerable. However, turtles can also be very determined and will venture far dif distances around an obstacle if they need to reach what is on the other side, say to access their nesting site. As such, the fencing should aim to extend into upland areas where it can be elbowed backwards away from the road, and this will help to direct any determined turtles that would be traveling along the fence line back away from the road and into the wetland. When considering the installation of fencing and underpasses, it's important to remember that each site has its own unique features and therefore should be assessed on an individual basis to determine the appropriate solutions. In the best case scenario, as shown in the diagram, we would be able to fence the entire wetland area with fencing elbowed back into the upland areas and directed towards the culvert to encourage turtles to use it to cross so that they can reach habitat on the other side of the road rather than having to cross on top of the road where they may be hit. The existing culvert would also be large enough to serve as a, as a suitable turtle underpass and there would be no obstacles. However, some sites do have impediments or barriers which limit the extent of fencing that can be installed. We will discuss a few of the main impediments and how we can apply adaptive solutions to overcome them in the following slides. So the first type of impediment is rock outcrops. Rock outcrops can act as barriers to installing fencing, but in other cases they can be used as an advantage to tie into fencing and prevent turtles from reaching the road, um, as shown in the small picture here in the corner. This all depends where the rock outcrop is located. It's more difficult to fence around a rock outcrop located in the middle of a wetland versus a rock outcrop located on either end of a wetland. If the rock outcrop is located at the end of a wetland, it, and it stretches far enough into the upland zone and it is at least three meters tall, then fencing can be tied into this area to deter turtles from reaching the road. One of the most common impediments is private property, driveways, structures, and other transportation access points such as secondary roads, railways, etc. Turtle fencing can be installed along the side of a road within the road allowance, but it cannot block someone's driveway or a structure. If the driveway or structure is located at the end of the wetland in an upland area where, where turtles will hesitate to travel, then the fencing may be installed up until this point and elbowed back away from the road. 
but if the driveway is located somewhere within the boundaries of the wetland, then fencing will have to direct the turtles to an additional tunnel located underneath the driveway, as shown in the small picture in the corner, so that the turtles can reach the wetland habitat on the other side of the driveway. It is important to note that the installation of a tunnel under a driveway must be approved by the property owner. However, if there are too many structures or driveways making it unfeasible to construct fencing, then a flashing turtle crossing sign can still be installed to alert drivers of turtles potentially on the road. The next impediment, which is also fairly common, is an unsuitable culvert. We know from the available scientific research that turtles typically require large openings greater than three feet or 0.9 meters in diameter so that they can see the sunlight through to the other side or else they will likely not enter. Unfortunately, some sites have culverts that are too small or ones that are not open enough due to blockages such as dirt, vegetation, or too much water like the one shown in this picture, or they're simply too degraded and falling apart. There are also some sites that do not have any culverts at all. In these cases, the corresponding municipality or road agency would be contacted to discuss the potential to install a new, larger culvert that could serve as a more suitable underpass for turtles, provided there's sufficient topographic relief. And that brings us to our next and final impediment. So some sites have low lying roads. So those are the ones that you drive on and it feels like you're at level with the wetland, similar to the one shown in the first picture here on the left. And that means that you may not have enough topographic relief to allow for the installation of a new or larger culvert. So topographic relief refers to the difference in elevation between two areas, in this case, between the top of the road and the bottom of the wetland. There needs to be enough space between these two areas along the slope to allow for the installation of fencing and a culvert or underpass. Some adaptive solutions can be taken in this case, such as installing ACO open top tunnels, which are generally smaller, so about 0.5 meters, and at grade, since the grates on the top let in light to compensate for the loss of size. So some examples of these tunnels are shown pictured here on this slide. The top right photo shows a view of the tunnel grates from on top of the road, and the bottom left photo shows inside an ACO um, tunnel and how the light penetrates through. And then the bottom left uh, photo shows a snapping turtle entering an ACO tunnel. These tunnels have been tested by many groups all over Ontario at Perscule Provincial Park, Long Point, and others, and are proven to work well for turtles in Ontario. There are also freestanding fence types that can be used to keep turtles off the road as well. So it's important to note that just because a site or wetland may have various impediments or barriers, this does not make it a lost cause. There are many effective adaptive solutions which can still be applied. For example, if we have a look at this diagram, we see a wetland that is bisected by a road that already has one culvert shown in black on the diagram, or rather blue, sorry. However, when we assess the site, the culvert was completely submerged in water and was therefore deemed unsuitable as a turtle crossing. The road is also relatively low lying with the wetland for most of this stretch, making it difficult to just replace the submerged culvert with a larger one. It would also not be suitable to install an ACO open top tunnel since it would likely become submerged. However, there was an area just up the road from here that had enough relief to install a larger culvert. Therefore, we proposed a new culvert installation for this area shown as a red culvert in the diagram. This would allow for turtles to cross safely under the road. In order to direct tur uh, turtles to this culvert, we have to fence the entire wetland, which is shown in blue. So if you notice on the map, there's also a private road um, next to the submerged culvert. In this section, we can install a culvert shown in red under the driveway with the property owner's consent to allow turtles to reach the other portion of the wetland. Fencing should also be directed to the culvert to limit the number of turtles climbing up and onto the driveway. Since it is not feasible to install fencing for the entire length of the driveway, two flashing turtle crossing signs should be installed to alert drivers of turtles potentially on the road in this area. So that's just in case any turtles 
were to somehow get on the driveway and then onto the road, this would alert drivers of that. This solution does not restrict turtle populations from moving across the landscape, and it also reduces road mortality by reducing the amount of road area that the turtles will use to cross, and by doing it in a designated area where the drivers are made well aware. We are so very fortunate that we are not the only ones working on these kinds of solutions to address turtle road mortality. There are many nonprofit organizations, conservation authorities, and other wildlife working groups, such as the Ontario Road Ecology Group, who are putting pressure on road agencies to address wildlife collisions. Many municipal road departments are also putting measures in place, as well as the Ontario Provincial Police, private companies such as EcoCare International, and the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, for example, in the Halliburton area. Finally, there is a legislation to mitigate wildlife collisions at wetlands, and Carrie Gunson from EcoCare has written guideline documents for both the MTO and MNRF to mitigate wildlife collisions. These include the best management practices for mitigating the effects of roads on amphibians and reptile species at risk in Ontario, and that's produced by the MNRF, and the Environmental Guide for Mitigating Road Impacts to Wildlife produced by the MTO. Here are just some of the projects that Carrie Gunson at EcoCare International has worked on in the past years since starting the company in 2009. She has been all over the world designing and implementing wildlife solutions for roads and is known as an expert in road ecology science, wildlife crossing structures, and wildlife exclusionary fencing, such as the ones shown here. Carrie also contributes to wildlife monitoring of the wildlife fencing and crossing structures to determine their effectiveness for different species. For example, she monitored a diversity of crossing structures and fencing on Highway 69 between 2011 and 2021 and has found that turtles successfully use drainage culverts as crossing tunnels to reach wetland habitat on the other sides of roads. You can also check out other EcoCare projects by going to the website link shown on the slide here. Similarly, there have been many success stories from projects and studies using reptile exclusion fencing and underpasses. The first example is from a study conducted by EcoCare International along a 5.5 kilometer long stretch of Highway 69 in northeastern Ontario between 2015 and 2016. This project built off a previous study conducted in 2011 and 2012 to install three twinned concrete box culverts and 4.8 kilometers of continuous reptile exclusion fencing on both sides of the road. In 2015, EcoCare maintained and repaired gaps in the original fencing, as well as installed an extension to result in 5.5 kilometers of continuous fencing in 2016, which accounted for the new highway realignment. When reptile monitoring was compared to 2012, fencing was proved to reduce turtle road mortality to just one juvenile snapping turtle and reduce the number of turtles on the road by 90.5%. In the second example, a turtle tunnel and fencing was installed in a turtle mortality hotspot on Highway 66 in Wisconsin in 2016. Turtle road mortality rates decreased from a whopping 66 deaths in one year to only 40 deaths over three years. That's equivalent to 13 deaths per year compared to the initial 40 deaths per year. On average, 30% of snapping turtles and 20% of peanut turtles successfully made it through the tunnel. The biologists on this project later vamped up the tunnels by installing metal flashings to shine more light through the tunnel, which encouraged more turtles to pass through. All in all, there was an 85% reduction in turtle road mortality in just one year, plus a complete 100% reduction in hatchling road mortality. Great wins for both of these projects. A more local and recent project was undertaken by the Halliburton Highlands Land Trust and Glenside Ecological Services Limited. This project involved the construction of a turtle underpass culvert shown in the first picture, along with half pipe exclusion fencing with steel rods and ends that elbowed back away from the road. It's important to note that this type of fencing is extremely durable in comparison to others, but it still requires some site maintenance but the vegetation must be cut and maintained along the fence so that turtles cannot use it to climb over. 
These efforts resulted in a whopping 90% reduction in turtle road mortality, and they even got pictures of different species of turtles using the tunnels. So in summary, it is important to remember that addressing roadkill hotspots is not only important for conservation and biodiversity, but also for human and motorist safety. We also have obligations under the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act, Species at Risk Act, and Endangered Species Act to protect turtles and other wetland species at risk in Ontario. Lastly, the, de the design and construction of turtle tunnels or fencing with underpasses is a straightforward long-term solution that has been proven to be highly effective for reducing road mortality and mitigating the largest threat to turtles, the most imperiled species globally. So if you're interested in being involved in our fight to help protect turtles here in the land between, you can do so by reporting any turtles and any areas in the region that you think might be turtle road mortality hotspots using the contact information on this slide. We will have staff assess the site or sites that you are concerned about. If you want to be more involved hands-on, then you can monitor for turtles along roads by registering to become a turtle guardian and participating in various citizen science opportunities, such as becoming a tunnel assessor, a wetland watcher, a nest sitter, and or a road researcher. You just have to visit the Turtle Guardian's website volunteer tab to sign up. Thanks again for listening and for taking interest in helping our shelled little friends.